Hello and welcome again to this edition of Capital Dateline Online. I'm your host, Brad Swanson. We're coming to you just a few blocks from Florida's capital at the headquarters of the Florida Cable Telecommunications Association. Once again, I am joined by Jim Saunders, the executive editor of the News Service of Florida, here to tell us about what's happening in Tallahassee and what to expect in the upcoming week. Jim, welcome. Thanks. All right, so we, uh, we are just about to kick off the 2017 legislative session. While uh, we always talk about, hey, are you ready? But it's really been going on for uh, several months now. Okay, uh, let's jump in on uh, the first issue. So we've been talking about a lot of the, uh, um, uh, the distance, if you will, uh, between the Senate and the House positions. And uh, it looks like they reached an accord on how they're going to talk about the budget. What happened there? Well, one of the issues that they've been talking about for a while is uh, a disagreement really has been sort of the basic budget rules. And that partly relates to or largely relates to uh, some issues that Speaker Richard Corcoran wanted to put forward to uh, what he said, put more transparency into the budget process, requiring bills to be filed for individual projects. The Senate had not bought into this whole approach. So there's been a lot of discussion around the Capitol about whether they could even sort of reach the, the basic ground rules of, of the budget process, and if not, whether that could hold things up. The Senate's basic objection was they said, you know what, the House can't bind us to their rules. We're two different branch or two different chambers and uh, and we are separate. We can set our own rules. So uh, but Friday, late Friday uh, afternoon, early Friday evening, they put out that they had reached an agreement. Speaker, uh, Speaker Corcoran and Senate President Negron had reached an agreement on some basic rules uh, the, the, each side gave a little bit to to right. to, uh, to move it forward. So at least from that process, that uh, standpoint, the budget is going to be going forward. Uh, the budget process. Now, whether they can reach agreement down the line on the numbers, on the programs, and so on. That's all to be seen, and it'll play out over the next couple of months. Now, is this just a great sign of just friendship and amicability during this upcoming session? I am not really sure at this no? point. No. Okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, I think we'll uh, I think we'll wait and see on that one. I mean, it, it's sort of a it, it's a procedural thing that probably nobody outside of Tallahassee cares about or knows about. But at least from some of the signs that had been going on around the Capitol, people worried that they wouldn't even be able to get these basic ground rules. Uh, uh, set up. Uh, from that standpoint, uh, it, it at least gets the ball rolling. All right. So, so, so we've got a little agreement between the two chambers, but really the big story of this week is going to be uh, kicking off session and the governor is going to start out with his state of the state speech. So, so w what do you think is going to come out in that speech? Do you have any thoughts on uh, where that's going to go? Well, it's going to be interesting. I mean, obviously the governor being the governor, a lot of it is going to be about jobs. <laughs> that's right. what he talks about uh, almost everywhere he goes. So from that standpoint, I think we, we can expect that. But uh, you know, he's been in this battle of words with Speaker Corcoran for a couple months now about uh, uh, Enterprise Florida and Visit Florida and some other economic development programs. These are very near and dear to the governor because he is jobs, jobs, jobs governor. And Speaker Corcoran's taking a pretty hard line that he doesn't want to fund these programs. In fact, he'd like to abolish some of them. So uh, it, I think it's going to be interesting to see what the governor says. He's going to be at the rostrum of the of the uh, of the House with Speaker Corcoran on one side and uh, Senate President Negron in there and, and a room full of, of legislators. So how is he going to address that? Will he address it head on or not? Uh, and also, interestingly, Speaker Corcoran's, uh, the House will be in session briefly before that. And, and generally, the House Speaker will give a, a speech uh, during this brief session before the the governor goes on. So it'll be interesting to see whether he says something before the governor starts. Speaking. Very close proximity for these uh, these two gentlemen who, who have been at odds, at least over this issue. But uh, we saw the uh, speaker say some very nice things about the governor as well at the end of this issue. And uh, so, uh, or, or a couple weeks ago. So we'll see, we'll see how that plays yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's day one. Right. I mean, all these things are going to play out over the next 60 days. Right. There's a lot of talk about the Session may not get done in 60 days, but, you know, it's early. Right, right. Well, for those of us junkies, you know, we, we, I don't know if we're, we're hoping for that or, uh, 
Um, but we'll, we're always eager to see. Okay, so let's jump into one of the first humongous issues that's really moving through session, and that's the workers' comp issue. It affects businesses, small and large, across the state, and Senator Bradley uh, has filed his bill. Uh, what's in the bill, and uh, what, what's it look like? Well, we've been waiting uh, to see, really, what's going to materialize on workers' comp. I mean, this issue has been out there for months. Uh, there was uh, two Supreme, Florida Supreme Court decisions uh, last year that, that uh, played a large role in a 14.5% in, in a rate increase for businesses and workers' comp insurance. So we knew something was going to happen this session with workers' comp. But uh, it is a very complex issue. Senator Bradley, who is a, a lieutenant of uh, Senate President Negron, filed a bill on Friday. It has a couple uh, key things in it, I think. One of which is that it would allow attorneys who represent uh, uh, injured workers to, to receive up to $250 an hour in attorney's fees. That has been the biggest hot button issue of this whole debate. The business community blames attorney's fees for driving up insurance rates. Uh, Bradley's bill would allow, again, up to 250 bucks an hour, which is considerably more than, than has been in previous law. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that one of those Supreme Court decisions struck down limits on attorney's fees. So Bradley is trying to address that issue in this bill. But it's going to be heavily debated what this attorney's fee provision should look like in the end. Another part of that bill would, uh, would change the way rates are filed. It's kind of a technical inside, uh, you know, the insurance industry kind of issue. But uh, in the past... Uh, a group called, or an organization called the uh, National Coun Council on Compensation Insurance has filed rates for the entire workers' comp industry with the state. Uh, under this bill, it would require the individual insurers to file their rates. Uh, this is something that's been talked about for a long time as well. It is controversial in the insurance industry right. and with, uh, with other parties. So that's another issue that I think is gonna be, uh, is gonna be key to this bill. Uh, and, and the House and the Senate reaching agreement. But as you alluded to, the business community is very tapped into this issue. Uh, trial, the trial lawyers are very tapped into the issue from the other side, mm -hmm. as well as groups like labor unions, uh, public safety unions, uh, because uh, not only does it affect whatever comes out of this, not only does it affect insurance rates, but it also, in fact, affects a lot of injured workers. Yeah, so. I mean, it, you know, I mean, you were talking about the entire gamut of the political makeup um, gets affected on all sides. Yeah, so. so far, his bill did not really, uh, if I if I understand it correctly, does not make a lot of changes in the health care part of workers' comp. Right. And uh, health care is another big lobby that, that watches this issue because there's a lot of payments that go to doctors and clinics and hospitals right. and, and, and everybody else that, that uh, treats injured workers. And we've seen those groups actually team up with the Florida Justice Association, a.k.a. the trial lawyers, and, uh, and work together in the past. So it'll be interesting to see who's working on whose side at any given moment. I would bet a lot of them are going to want to stay out of it. Now, whether yeah. they'll get dragged into it, I don't know. Right. All right, so, so, so that is a huge issue that affects everybody. But another issue that affects the entire legislative conversation is the one we, we, we began by talking about, which is the economic development incentives. Uh, that's up on Monday this week, today. Uh, for those of us tuning in this afternoon, they'll probably be uh, watching us in committee, so that's good. Um, but no, it's bad. <laughs> um, but uh, that issue's up, and uh, that's coming to a vote in the Rules Committee. So yeah. so what, what happens if it passes, and wh what's its next stop? Well, we're, I, we're, I think we're, it's we're probably about ready to go to the floor. Uh, there's two bills at this point, one of which is uh, a bill that would abolish Enterprise Florida and mm -hmm. a, a number of other agencies. And then there's a second bill that would make all sorts of uh, changes in Visit Florida, which is the tourism marketing mm -hmm. agency. Uh, and uh, But, you know, Speaker Corcoran doesn't want to fund these programs. In fact, uh, you know, the, the Visit Florida bill even does not have a, a, a budget number in it. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's to be decided during the budget process. So, uh, so, you know, the House seems to be moving full speed ahead with these bills. Uh, we haven't really seen any movement in the Senate, and, uh, and the governor will veto. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty clear that he would veto these bills. Right. Uh, really, I think the, the major issue is going to come down to budget and whether these programs get funded this year. Yeah, funding is going to be the key. I mean, you can you can leave it as an institution, but if there's no money, it's 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 
zeroed out essentially. Yeah, I mean, and uh, how they how effective they will be uh, right. over the coming year would would be a budget issue. All right, so the next big issue comes down typically between for profit and not for profit hospitals, but that's the C O N issue. Uh, nursing homes are are being discussed in the in the fight as well. So so where is that issue? And and it looks like we're going to see some movement on it yeah, this on, week. Yeah, on Tuesday uh, it's coming up in another House committee and. Uh, the, Speaker Corcoran and his leadership want to get rid of the certificate of need process, which is a process in which hospitals and nursing homes and hospice uh, providers have to get uh, approval from the uh, state to be able to build new facilities. So, you know, Speaker Corcoran's wanted to get rid of this for a while, and uh, it's it's already cleared one committee in the in the House. It's going to another one. Uh, so this is this is an issue that that they are going to press in the House. Uh, the, the Senate has been resistant in the past, but uh, but it you know again, the House starts moving the bill, and then the deals start getting cut late in session. And you know part of the thing too this year is, as you alluded to, it's not just hospitals that would be affected. That's been the house the House proposal in the past was just to to eliminate certificate of need for hospitals. But this year they've got nursing homes and hospice in there as well. And I can tell you firsthand. Uh, both of those industries are lobbying heavily on this issue. They want out of the bill. They want to keep the certificate of need process in law. Uh, and as you said, the hospitals are fairly split on this issue. Uh, a lot of hospitals want to keep certificate of need, but there's some for-profit companies that want to get rid of it, which would help them to be able to build new facilities. Right, enter the market and provide right. new, new right. facilities. Okay, so so from hospitals and healthcare to education and children, so the charter schools um, have an issue that's pending and, and uh, funding on their construction, and wh where does all that stand, and, and is that coming up this week? You know, Speaker Corcoran has made a big priority out of school choice legislation. He wants to expand cho school choice, whether it be through charter schools or whether it be through these scholarship programs the state has established to help uh, children have alternatives to the regular public school system. A lot of cases that involves uh, helping children go to private schools. Uh, the charter school legislation uh, involves uh, helping charter schools get uh, money to build facilities, right. which has been an issue for years, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the other bill, which is coming up this week in committee, is more of a, a programmatic, if you will, uh, sort of school choice program. Mm -hmm. Part of that program would... Uh, would would expand uh, the Gardner Scholarship Program, mm -hmm. which helps kids with disabilities. The other part of the the bill would would uh, increase funding that would go to private schools as part of the tax credit scholarship program. As we've I think we've discussed in the past, right. uh, the mm -hmm. Supreme Court recently uh, rejected a challenge to this program, which uh, which essentially uses uh, corporations get tax credits for donate or contributing money to this right. program and then the, the the money helps pay for children to go to private schools and uh, the bill that's up in the House committee would expand the funding that would go with the students to those private schools so it, it would be a, a boost to that program right. so uh, again Speaker Corcoran has made this a priority and the Senate has been pretty amenable to school choice particularly this tax credit scholarship right. program and the Gardner program, it's named after former Senate President Andy right. Gardner. <clears throat> so, um, you know, these things are starting to move. And uh, I do think uh, from what Speaker Corcoran has said over time, that this is going to be one of his priorities. Now, do you expect uh, the FEA and groups like that that traditionally oppose that to turn out in full force to speak against these bills? You know, I'm not really sure about where they are in the Gardner program, mm -hmm. but they have been adamantly uh, opposed to expansion or critical of the expansion of the tax credit scholarship program. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Florida Education Association Union uh, led the legal battle to try to get this program uh, found unconstitutional. Right. Now, they were unsuccessful, but I don't think their arguments have changed just because the Supreme Court rejected that case. Right. It's interesting. The teachers union, you know, they, they show up on these issues um, all the time. But uh, well, you know. you know, vouchers to them or voucher type of programs are are a non-starter. Right. I mean, they have been from I mean, for the from past 20 years. I mean, Jeb Bush 
they fought Jeb Bush tooth and nail about these right, programs. Right. So I don't think anything's going to change. They're going to keep fighting them. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move out of the Capitol a little bit and uh, look at something that comes around in Florida's constitution every so often. Uh, the, the Constitutional Revision Commission, we've had some recent appointments. I think we're still waiting for a few more. Where does that stand and uh, what are we looking at? Well, this is a, you know, it's kind of a wonky inside Tallahassee thing, but it's a big deal. Right. I mean, there's a 37 member commission that's going to work over the next uh, maybe year and a half, a little less than that, uh, to decide mm -hmm. uh, proposed changes to the state constitution to put on the November 2018 ballot. Uh, uh, Governor Scott uh, last week uh, appointed Carlos Baruf, who is a a uh, home builder from down in uh, the Manatee, Sarasota the area. Former Senate candidate. For, he right. ran for the U.S. Senate last year. He's very, apparently very close to the governor. Uh, he appointed him as the chairman of this commission. Mm -hmm. uh, he also, the governor also made 14 other appointments. A lot of them were people who the governor has very close ties to, both politically as well as, uh, you know, in his background. So uh, uh, we'd also, uh, Senate President Negron has appointed members. Speaker Corcoran will appoint members today, is what we're hearing Monday uh, again. Uh, and uh, uh, Chief Justice uh, George LaBarga has appointed three members, and then uh, Attorney General Bondi is, is an automatic member of this commission. Right. But it is something that comes around every 20 years. I mean, this is, this is not a common thing, and uh, so... It's high stakes. It's high stakes, and also I think it's important to note that this is the first year that Republicans have controlled all of the appointments except for the Supreme Court, uh, three appointments right. from the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice. Uh, the last time this occurred, Lawton Childs was still governor. He made appointments to, uh, and, and then the Republicans appointed from the legislative branches or chambers. But, uh, but right now the, the Republicans control uh, again, other than what uh, Chief Justice LaBarga did, they control all the appointments to this. So there could be some pretty far-reaching proposals come out of this commission that go on the ballot next year. Uh, and, and there's uh, no ju judicial oversight. There's no single source, which means you can only have one topic right there. Well, one thing I do think is important to keep in mind, though, is uh, since the last commission, the, the Constitution has been changed that you need 60% approval to pass constitutional right. amendments. And so these, whatever they put on the ballot, it's gonna have to meet a higher hurdle than it did in the past when it was a simple majority. Right. So I think that's sort of interesting. It also, it may, it may influence how far they're willing to go with some of these questions, right. because if they go too far, they're not gonna pass. Right, and, well, and, and the trick with those constitutional amendments is, is they're most popular with the electorate on day one, and then the opponents of them have have a chance to run those campaigns Well, that's the thing, them. there's gonna be, you know, it's it's, it's a lot harder to get to 60% than it used to be to 50 plus one. Right. So because you can run campaigns against these things. Uh, a perfect example is in uh, 2014, the first time medical marijuana was on the ballot, it only got 50, it got 58%, almost 59% and failed. Right. So, uh, you know, it came back in 2016 and passed, but, uh, it, that's an example of how hard it is to get to 60 percent. So. Well, well, I, I tell you what, those will be uh, interesting uh, recommendations coming out. And I know the watchers of the process are, uh, you know, the wonks are in there for sure. But I think uh, folks will be surprised at uh, once the cards are laid on the deck to see what amendments come out. Yeah. All right. So so let's shift away. So we're about to start the legislative session. So it's it's all policy. Fundraising ends tonight, right? <laughs> Much to the joy of, of those who write checks in the process. But I know nothing um, about that. Right, right, right. Last week, though, um, we had a couple of candidates mm -hmm. declare their intentions to run for governor. Who well, I don't think it was any surprise, but uh, Andrew Gillum, the, the Tallahassee mayor, uh, announced that he was going to run for governor. Mm -hmm. He's been laying the groundwork for this uh, for some time. He's a Democrat, uh, fairly liberal, uh, and, but he and young. Uh, telegenic, uh, you know, I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's, he has been laying the groundwork for this for a while. Mm -hmm. He um, uh, is the first one really prominent a, a gubernatorial candidate to get in. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're expecting a whole lot of others in, including Adam Putnam uh, on the Republican side, right. uh, probably Gwen Graham on the Democratic side. 
Uh, there's been others mentioned like Bob Buckhorn, the Tampa mayor, Philip Levine, the Miami Beach mayor. So uh, this, was, this was sort of the first shot. Right. Uh, followed a, a day or two later by Chris King, who's a businessman down in Orlando, right. also f uh, uh, took the first steps towards running as a Democrat. So, uh, and know, what's Chris King's background? Well, he's he's in the uh, my understanding he's in the affordable housing business down there, mm -hmm. and uh, you know he, I don't believe he has a, a real political you know office holder type of background. Right, right. But you know we've seen over the past uh, another one I forgot to mention was John Morgan. Right. Uh, but uh, you know we've seen over the past as yet to declare few, though, few, right, right. few uh, election cycles yeah. that you don't necessarily have to be in the business to get elected governor or president. Right, so, right, uh, right. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think I think it'll be interesting too from the Republican side. Uh, I think everybody thinks Adam Putnam's gonna run. Right. Uh, but Richard Corcoran is also being mentioned as a, as a possible candidate. Uh, and there could be others out there we just don't know about at this point. Well, well, we'll have to stay tuned probably till after session for anyone that's involved in the process to make any announcements. But uh, well, I think it was important for people like Gillum to get in early because he's going to need to raise money. Right. He's going to need to raise his visibility across the state. So if they're at Philip Levine, we see the same sort of uh, process going on. He's a right. Miami Beach mayor. He's making a lot of appearances around the state. So people like Gillum and Levine need to get out there right. and become statewide presences early. Well, it should be interesting to see uh, if they use any of the activity in the legislative session as uh, uh, standard bearers against it, um, you know, out you there. You can bet there will be a lot of uh, <laughs> we'll <laughs> press see. conferences. Well, Jim, thanks so much for joining us once again, and uh, we look forward to getting back with you next week and, and uh, getting the, uh, the review and then the preview of uh, the week. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the time we have for now. Thank you for joining us. For more news and views, visit us on our Facebook page at Capital Dateline Online or connect with us via Twitter uh, at the FCTA. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.